Thanks, everybody. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and, and really appreciate the, the uh, hosts, DMARC Bio, and, and uh, being a part of JEXI. Um, as uh, Jeffrey mentioned, um, my name is Dave Hyatt. I'm with Weka IO is the, the pronunciation. We have a lot of people wondering how to pronounce it. Weka, Weka, Waka. Uh, essentially what Weka stands for is uh, 10 to the power of 30. So you saw the zeta bytes. Eventually you will get to Weka bytes. And we are very uh, much on the way. So what I wanted to talk to you today about um, is essentially the it, this, this title is kind of uh, tongue in cheek actually because the reality is you, you, nothing happens without hardware and nothing happens without software. They are interactive and uh, intimately tied. And there are challenges though with hardware in the sense that that's the um, adaptation we, we see in virtualization. Virtualization technology is meant to overcome some of the, the barriers that hardware has, um, and we take advantage of that. Okay, so the changing face of high-performance computing. High-performance computing is used uh, quite extensively in life sciences. Actually, its uh, origins are really around physical science and engineering. The scientific applications are seismology, computational, uh, fluid dynamics and, and weather simulations, things of those na that nature. And traditionally, the architectures were quite sophisticated. Uh, you're familiar with Cray computing. Uh, a lot of the national labs were the origins of this to, to work on these heavy computational uh, uh, problems. And these were traditionally, the, the data sets involved were massive as, as they are today. But the systems were architected around the, the technology of the day, meaning rotating me media, the spinning hard disks, and it, in essence, there are limitations to that hardware. And in order to overcome those, uh, the, the file systems optimized, uh, the, syst the application was optimized for large files and sequential access, which is what a hard disk does very, very well. They, <laughs> However, life sciences really changes a lot of that. What we have now is the need for random access and sequential access, because uh, when you look at genomic data, uh, there are millions of small files, thousands of directories that you have to search through as you analyze data. That causes problems for traditional architectures. You have uh, both the small and large files, and all of this has to be done at extremely low latency. Otherwise, people are waiting around. So um, as we ch move into uh, the next phase, you're, you, you also have issues around the compute itself. Not just storage, but mind you, but compute. So what you're seeing is a, a massive uh, 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 condensation or uh, the density, actually the density of compute has extreme, uh, is, uh, increased ex dramatically. We have uh, many more cores in, C in CPUs now to do processing. GPUs are a, a classic example of a specialized form in that they have hundreds of cores within a single chip. Meaning, what does that mean? Ultimately, the rack density or uh, compute density is increased to a point where the storage systems have to keep those compute uh, uh, cores busy. And that's quite a, quite a challenge, especially when you're using GPUs because they're designed for processing things in parallel. Add to that the data growth we already talked about, and I, and I actually, intentionally left out that nice uh, chart we saw before because I usually use that and everybody's seen it, so. But the other aspect of this, new applications. AI machine learning was mentioned earlier. That's a, a, a burgeoning field. It's been around a long time, but in those situations, you actually have uh, the data itself 
you're going to, you're going to continue to add to that to, to improve the algorithm's accuracy. Uh, and we see that regularly in our customers. Uh, and what this does, what this has resulted in is a unique challenge in terms of data storage. How do we access all that information? We talked about the need for a lot of information and the need to scale and grow uh, and make that data accessible. The infrastructure has to keep pace. And that's, what, that's where the challenge has been for companies like mine. Um, we, and in fact, that's one of the, the aspects I'll get into in terms of, of uh, how we do things a little differently. So you, you see the analytical tools and challenges. I mentioned CryoEM here, because CryoEM in, in and of itself, while genomic data has its unique challenges, the millions of small files that, and random access, CryoEM is a different set of challenges. And most research organizations have both. They will, if they have a, uh, a um, CryoEM machine, they most definitely have sequencers. So that puts additional uh, strains on the infrastructure. And in, in essence, what we see, you can see here from the protein data bank, the rapid increase in the number of mappings that have been released. And these are essentially, as you, they are, they're trying to visually map a protein, which is computationally very uh, challenging, much more so than X-ray crystallography or NMR. So that in and of itself, and then you see protein-protein interaction, and here's, whoops. You also see the resolution of these uh, machines has dropped dramatically. It's actually, it's now down to two, two and a half angstroms, which is extremely small. Uh, they, all of this drives the need for change. We've talked about cloud, the need for cloud, its benefit of, of uh, extensibility and, and uh, data sharing. Data sharing is a, 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 has been a need for quite some time and it will always be that way. But the challenge has been and continues to be standardized data formats. There's, everybody has their own formats, different applications have their formats, they have different metadata tags and how do I know what that data really relates to? Uh, and in fact, if you were, I don't know if anybody uh, attended the BioIT conference that was here earlier this week, but there was a special track on data commons. Um, and it was to address these different things. This is an international effort uh, led in part by the NIH. Um, some other factors that figure in here are are the different processors you have. I mentioned GPUs. We have TPUs now, TensorFlow processing units for machine learning. We have FPGAs like, uh, that are suitable for genomic data, like the uh, Dragon system from Etico Genome, which is now actually part of Illumina. And we also, I attended an HPC uh, conference recently, and now we have quantum processors that are actually coming to market. Actually, not quite to market, but prototypes which uh, are a whole different animal. But ultimately, the biggest uh, uh, issue and change is in the form of data processing and analysis. And that is where machine learning is taking place. This is really a, a burgeoning field, as I mentioned. But again, so the, the challenges here come, come about where you're trying to get around hardware limitations, and so you have to bend the rules of reality of those hardware limitations, and you can only do that through software. So actually, one of the, it's interesting to note that healthcare, pharma, and life sciences are one of the leading adopters, according to the survey by Infosys, on uh, machine learning and AI. So it, it is uh, a, a, as I said, a burgeoning field. What I'd like to do is introduce you to the concept of software-based storage. I've, I've met with some of you earlier and, and kind of uh, outlined a few things, but what I want to, to, to kind of describe is a flexible architecture. It's high performance in a parallel file system, and what that is is a bunch of technical uh, wording for, I need to access, uh, uh, supply access to the same data from multiple people. They need to be able to access that same file. And parallel file systems were designed for that. 
It's also flash-based, meaning you have a compute cluster, let's use it. It has flash in it, that provides that random access for the small files of genomics, yet it can also provide the performance for massive image files, the terabyte size image files coming off cryo EM machines. It has cloud scalability. You have to be able to, to, uh, to uh, scale both the, the, in terms of capacity, but also be able to collaborate, as well as be application uh, agnostic. I need to run my existing applications. I can't re-architect re or buy new applications. I want my existing tools to work with this thing. So it has to be able to support all of that. Uh, and this, in essence, provides the ability to handle CPU workloads, GPU workloads, uh, and, and in essence, the difference between the two is multiple processors, but in terms of the actual number of, uh, or, or performance numbers, you're looking at four, if you think about a file being, uh, say, a gigabyte in size, that's not too uncommon, especially in, in genomic data. Uh, these can process, GPUs can typically consume about uh, four to five gigabytes a second. And our, our solution can provide it at now at 11 gigabytes a second. So we can saturate those cores and keep the, the processing going as opposed to waiting. And I'll share an example of that. But here's what it is, conceptually this is what it is. It's a software layer that resides, uh, is this my pointer? Yes, okay. So right in here, this is a separate storage server running the software. These are x86 servers, it doesn't matter what kind, and with SSDs in them. And I could easily integrate this software up here in this layer and eliminate this entire layer if, I, if that were the, the deployment model you wanted to use. But ultimately, that's not the value because uh, solid state disk is very expensive. I need to integrate it with something that really scales and is cost effective and leverages hard disk technology, which is much more cost effective. And we can integrate that into a cloud in the form of public or private. So if you want, needs to retain, stay on premises in your data center, you can do that to the application. The combination of flash and cloud appear as a single massive data pool that is shareable. So we talk about bending the rules of reality. The traditional belief is data is heavy. Keep your compute near the data. Actually, with today's networks, data locality is irrelevant. You can see how long it takes an, a solid state disk that's directly attached to a computer to read it. Uh, a 4K block, you can see down here, oops, wrong button. Uh, essentially, the, performance, the time it takes to transfer it over a network. At 10 gig network, it takes five microseconds. At uh, 100 gig, it's 0.5 microseconds. Why do I need to keep things in one location? If I can distribute it, I can parallel process it and eliminate a lot of wait time for the researcher. Another axiom, use a local file system directly attached to the computer, that's the fastest way to go. And this was something I had to get my head around and I've been in the industry for a while. It really comes down to the power of parallelism. If I take a single block of data and I slice it into small segments and distribute it in parallel across that, I can, my latency is only this, it's not this. So I've immediately improved performance. And here's a classic example in a machine learning application where we have demonstrated this. You'll see this was a machine learning with using a, a self-driving vehicle, uh, massive image files, and you see down here, a, blade, a flash blade-based system, the performance it was uh, capable of, uh, of, and here is a local file system directly attached to that um, computer, uh, that server. We actually provided twice the performance of that. Here's more close to home in genomics data. Uh, here's a, a standard research, uh, this was a customer of ours who did some uh, analysis. They were doing BCL to FASTQ file conversions. And our system took approximately 
53 minutes or so to process, do that conversion on this particular file. And we were compared against a leading platform. And you can see they actually provide a little bit of performance with the exception of in, in, in these types of applications, you never do one thing anytime. In life sciences, it's generally millions of times or hundreds of times. And so uh, as we scale, they scaled it out and did six conversions, we took the same amount of time and each subsequent conversion added 15 minutes of run time. That's wall clock time. That means it's a researcher going to, to lunch or taking his coffee break because he's waiting on results. Um, supporting you, new uh, use models is also uh, an opportunity for software. This was a cryo-EM workshop. Workshops are common in academia. And in this case, he, he had students coming from all over. They had their own data they were going to work on in the workshop. You cannot share that. You don't want it in a, a shareable pool. And that's what the software is designed. That massive namespace I talked to you about before, I can carve it up and I can make certain pieces shareable and others non-shareable. And essentially that's what he ended up with. Very, and this is it completely in Amazon. There is nothing on-prem here. So we run in Amazon on their instances or we will run on hardware in your data center. And find another, the, the last one, you have a cooperative uh, data model and this is common in some of the, the research institutes where you'll have an investigator joining the staff. He has his own uh, equipment. You can add that equipment. Normally compute, you do that a lot. You'll share compute power. You can actually, why can't you do it with storage? You can. You can take and add compute to this uh, single namespace and they can leave and it dynamically adjusts to that without any impact, and now you have shared processing and storage, the final portion being data sharing. Uh, this is extremely important. I can share data, have data at one location using that cloud-based backend. I can share that over a high performance network uh, and, and have collective access to that. So in summary, IT infrastructure effect does absolutely affect the the pace of scientific discovery in these ways. Um, you, you understand, hopefully understand a little bit more about the complexities of the data of the, the different types and disciplines in science and what uh, the need for is in terms of the underlying supporting infrastructure. And then the results obviously are supporting the advanced analytics of machine learning that are just starting to be used in many disciplines as well as researcher productivity. These are some of our customers. We're uh, in the genomics life sciences space, also in general high performance computing and, and also in machine learning. So um, I appreciate very much your time and attention. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to get a hold of me. We are going to be uh, 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 having a drawing for an I Apple iWatch. So please stop by, register. Um, and if you're interested in, in trying us out for free, you can go to Amazon Marketplace and start.weka.io and, and use it. So thank you so much. <laughs>